All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, we will start our uh, discussion. And uh, I'm a policeman of my friend. Unfortunately, he had to leave her to New York for because of some work situation. So as you see, my name is Chalo Petita. So we will start. It's uh, Mr. Steve Croshaw. His uh, title of this workshop, workshop is uh, uh, Nonviolence Principle and Strategies. And I will read uh, briefly the uh, bio of Mr. Kroshoff. Uh, Mr. Kroshoff is Director of uh, Office of Secretary General, General at Amnesty International. He joined this uh, uh, international, joined as an international advocacy director in uh, 2010. From 2002 to 2010, he worked for Human Rights Watch, uh, first as UK director and then as United Nations advocacy director. He was journalist for many years, joining uh, Independent at the launch in 1986 where his rule included responsibility for coverage of East European Revolution, cleft of, so cleft of Soviet Union, and Balkan Wars. He is co-author of Small Act of Resistance, he brought his book here, subtitled How Courage, Tenacity, and Bit of Ingenuity Can Change the World, prefaced, prefaced by Voslov Havel, and translated into uh, several languages such as Arabic, French, Persian, and Tibetan and Chinese in 2010. It's coming up, and it's coming in, in this June. And his previous work, uh, book included Goodbye to USSR, 1992, and uh, Easier Fatherland, Germany and 21st Century, published in 2004. He studied Russian and German at University of Oxford and St. Petersburg. So I give you the microphone and we start to talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for that and, uh, and thank you for being here this evening when I know there's a very powerful event going on in, in parallel as well. Um, as you said there, it was described as a, a workshop. I think that we have a, a, a limited amount of time um, that to, to deal with. And what I'd like to do is actually just to share some stories about change and about nonviolence, about the amazing thing that nonviolence can do. Um, obviously, that involves courage very, very often. Um, but it also involves humor. And, and I like the fact that there is often mischief and humor involved in nonviolence, and that some of the most effective kind of non-violent strategies. A small detail, thank you. <laughs> um, I hope that you could hear some of the introduction even without the microphone. So, dealing with non-violence and some of the amazing things that, that non-violence um, can do. Um, I'm here, all of you know so much about China, I know much less, obviously my organization Amnesty International works very much on China issues, on, uh, on freedom of expression issues, on human rights defenders issues, and, and a range of different things. Um, but um, what I will focus on this evening, and, and there are some great stories that I would tell, um, which, are, which are from China, both in China and from China, and indeed from the umbrella protests, we heard stories today in any case in the discussions. But what I will try to do just now is to lay out a little bit of what I've seen over the years, which I've been very privileged by chance, actually, as much as anything else. Um, as uh, was just mentioned, I became a journalist at The Independent in 1986, um, and therefore saw some incredible things there, the East European revolutions and other things. Um, but I would actually like to begin my story even earlier than that. In uh, 1980, when I went to Poland, when I was teaching English, I'd been a student, I'd studied Russian, I'd lived in Russia for a year, but I didn't, having finished my studies, I went to live in Poland. And I just went because I thought it seemed an interesting place. Um, but I was incredibly lucky that I was living there in 1980 when solidarity happened. Now, I always do this when I'm doing a series of events. I think this audience will be different, but it's interesting to know. I think I can confidently say if I mention the word Berlin Wall, that everybody in the room will know exactly what that is. If I mention the name, Nelson Mandela, I think I can confidently say that everybody in the room 
uh, will know exactly uh, what I'm talking about. If I mention the word solidarity or Lech Valencia, can I ask for a show of hands of how many people know more or less what that means? Uh, it, it, I'll explain the answer in a moment. I mean, it, it, more I'm asking, does the word solidarity and the organization solidarity and the name like Valencia, does it mean much? I think I saw some hands, but not very many, which doesn't surprise me, as I have begun for it not to surprise me. Um, back in 1980 and then 1989, I, I, the smallest thing, I, I know where this one will go, but for you as well to see, if I say Berlin Wall, can I see a show of hands? <coughs> yeah, I, I think the ones who aren't raising their hands know it anyway. Uh, and, and basically, you all know it. That happened in 1989. But in 1980, there was an incredible, incredible set of events in Poland which are now much less known. People think of Mikhail Gorbachev, who again is very famous, and everyone in this room will be aware of the reformist Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, who came in 1985. But there was a before Gorbachev, and you could even say a reason, one of the reasons why Gorbachev, the reformer, came to power, why the hardliners chose a reformer, because they had such difficulties in Poland. So that's where I was, 1980. And this was a time when Leonid Brezhnev, the then Russian leader, uh, was was in power still in the Kremlin. He was a, very much a hardline leader. He'd sent tanks into Czechoslovakia in 1968. He had sent tanks into Afghanistan. He had he was ready to send tanks anywhere. It was called the Brezhnev Doctrine, which was like, if you do things wrong in your bit of the communist country, we will send tanks in. So it seemed impossible to create real change then. And then there was a series of strikes which started in Poland, and the strikes were about kind of economic issues, they seemed to be economic issues, but out of those strikes, people said, well, we need more than just a price rise, a, a raise in our salaries, and, and a couple of basic demands. We need an independent trade union. And the independent trade union in Poland at that time was, I can say, I think confidently, as unthinkable as it would be to have it in China today. It was just quite unthinkable. You could not have an independent trade union because, of course, that challenged the regime completely. So all the commentators in the West uh, and around the world said they're kind of crazy even asking for this. It's bound to go wrong. And I was living there during this extraordinary period where it lasted a few weeks and they actually got solidarity was legalized. And the head of solidarity who I noticed it's a classic thing that the older people in the audience uh, had indeed all heard of it, Lech Valencia, the moustache electrician who was the leader. They did this incredible thing, solidarity was legalized in the middle of the Soviet bloc, uh, I say, as a, 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 take whatever comparison you like, but completely unthinkable. And it was there for a while, and then about 16 months later, the following year, uh, tanks came in, and they banned solidarity. They ended it, they arrested the leaders, they killed some people, they arrested others, they jailed others. And it was really interesting that, again, the intelligent people who seemed to understand so much all said, yeah, yeah, you see, it, it couldn't really work because they were asking for too much. And so, of course, it has gone back to the status quo when there is no independent state union any longer. And they declared martial law, um, they brought in the tanks on the streets, and it seemed as though everything was finished. And that's kind of where my story begins, is the incredible things that came in. It seemed to be the very end, and actually it wasn't the very end. It was actually the very beginning of everything that came in. And there's a wonderful quote from a Polish writer from those years, uh, Czesław Miłosz, who was a Nobel Prize winning writer, and he said, our natural tendency to place the possible in the past leads us often to overlook the acts of our contemporaries who defy the presumably unmoving <coughs> order of things and they accomplish what at first sight has seemed impossible. In other words, we take for granted, oh yeah, that set of changes happened, that was okay, that set of changes happened, that was okay, that set of changes happened, that was kind of normal, we explain it away afterwards. But then we look at what we have today and say, well, that can never change. And that's what people were thinking at that time. And he said, actually, the incredible acts 
uh, as he says, the, those who define a presumably unmovable order of things, those are creating change the whole time. And he was absolutely right, as, as, as you'll see from the stories I will tell now. I said I would tell some stories of humor and, and of mischief. And as you also know from China, sometimes those are actually the most powerful ones that there can be. My friend Sergei Popovich, who has written an interesting book called Blueprint for Revolution, uh, he has invented the phrase, I think he invented it, he has a phrase called laughtivism, which is activism with laughter. And he says, we shouldn't just think of this as a little thing, but actually, laughterism is a, a big thing. Um, he was part of the movement which helped bring down Slobodan Milosevic, the dictator in Serbia. And he, during that time, he came out with a great line which was, if you are beating me, and I am laughing at you, you are the loser. And they showed that to be true, Okpor in Serbia, but also the people in, in Poland, both of which I, I saw and reported on a lot, as a, both living there and then as a journalist. Again and again, they laughed at the rulers, and in a sense, they managed to win against the rulers by keeping that humor and mischief, and it left the rulers who didn't know what to do. So let me tell you a couple of stories. One was um, shortly after the tanks had been put on the streets in Poland, uh, which was December 81. A couple of months after that, um, there was a boycott of the television news was declared by Solidarity. Illegal Solidarity, but they still came to boycott the TV news. It's about a common protest, of course. And for those who are interested, I can tell you the story, if you don't know how the word boycott came to happen. It's an interesting little story that began in Ireland. So there was a boycott of the television news. Um, and then people who were doing this said, well, but what's the point of a boycott of television news? Because nobody knows that we're doing it. It was, you're right. Okay, what should we do? And so, with different groups came up with different ideas. So some people said, let's take our television sets and put them in the windows, facing out onto the street, facing outwards and dark, from 7.30 to 8 every evening. And then people will know, we're not watching TV news in our household. People said, okay, that's kind of a nice idea. And then other people said, yeah, but we like the idea of a kind of protest where you can see you're protesting. So, they decided to go out every evening between 7.30 and 8. And very important was they didn't have any slogans, but they just filled the streets every day between 7.30 and 8, the time of the TV news, and they would walk around. And actually, as many of you will, will know, in, in uh, China, in Shanghai particularly, but elsewhere also, there were similar protests where it's like, no, we're not protesting, we just happen to be here. And so those people did that. They went out for half an hour during the TV news, and it was difficult to arrest them because how could you tell the difference between someone who was going for a walk and somebody who was protesting? But the fact was they weren't watching TV news. But, and then this is my favorite part of the story, there was a third group who, like the first element of having the television was physically there, they liked the second element of taking part in some kind of action. So what did they do? They took the televisions out of their apartments, they carried them downstairs, they put them into like wheelbarrows or babies' strollers, and they then walked along the streets with the television. And again, no slogans of any kind. They walked around the streets. One town in particular in eastern Poland, but it, it spread to other towns, including to Warsaw. So in this town in Świdnik, they walked around with the televisions in the wheelbarrows or in the streets. And again, the police didn't kind of know what to do. They kind of, they did arrest some of the people, but they couldn't quite find something in the criminal code that says you aren't, aren't allowed to walk around with the television in a wheelbarrow. That kind of wasn't in the criminal code. So basically, what the authorities, the only thing they found to do was they changed the curtain at the time when you could be shot for leaving your house. They brought that from 11 o'clock in the evening till 7 o'clock in the evening. And the protesters then suddenly moved their action to the late afternoon TV news at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So, in other words, the authorities had all the guns, they had all the power, they had absolutely everything, but in a very, very small kind of way. And that's the, the title of the book, is, uh, as mentioned, that we were a small act of resistance. In a tiny kind of way, it was the protesters who won. There were many, many, many other protests like this that ran through the 1980s. And again, in a, abroad, people said, yeah, solidarity is dead. I, I lost count of the number of conversations I had when people explained to me how it was quite naive to think that solidarity, this 
amazing independent trade union, which I call it a trade union. In effect, it was like an opposition party, but of course it didn't call itself that. But basically, it was an opposition within the Soviet Union. And people said, yeah, yeah, of course it couldn't exist. It's kind of gone and it's dead. But the Poles continued protesting. And uh, my next story comes from 1987. And there was a, a lovely, a wonderful group called the Orange Alternative. And I encourage you to look it up. They basically treated all of their protests as a kind of uh, surreal act of humor and mischief. And many, many actions they organized. Some of my favorites, one was when they organized one on the anniversary of the Russian Revolution, the 70th anniversary of the Russian Revolution in 1987. And um, they were kind of feeling bored because people were always protesting against communism. So they said, why do we not protest against, let's protest, let's have a rally in favor of communism. So they organized a pro-communist rally and everybody had to wear something red, a red shirt or a red tie or a red anything, you had to turn up. And um, the secret police, of course, knew perfectly well this was meant with irony, but they didn't quite know how to deal with the irony, because again, it's <laughs> difficult to arrest people for the crime of irony, basically. And uh, so there were these uh, demonstrations that were going on, including my very favorite slogan from that period, was uh, one demanding better working hours for secret police. They said it's very, very unfair that secret police have to work 24 hours a day, and we think they should be allowed to work just an eight hour day. So we <laughs> demand better working conditions for the secret police. And the secret police, of course, who were arresting them at the same time, it was like, yeah, well, I would like to work a bit less, actually. <laughs> um, so that was, a, a, again, a nice story. There were many, many, there were dozens of stories like that throughout Poland throughout that time. Now, whenever I tell these kind of stories, people say, look, it's kind of nice, they're kind of cute, they're quite funny, but fundamentally, what have changed? Well, the answer is actually, a lot of it changed, and since everything had changed, partly because of these tiny, tiny little bits of, of change. Um, so that demonstration I described, like I say, was 1987. By the end of 1988, the government was again talking to Solidarity. Solidarity, which you remember, they had banned eight years earlier, and which everyone in the West said, you were crazy, it was never going to work anyway. They unbanned Solidarity. They hold round table talks. They had weeks, even months of discussions, because they couldn't find a round table that was going to be big enough for them all to sit around, but that's another one. They, create, they made a round table eventually. Um, and um, that, those round table talks happened. They happened, they began in, in early 1989. In June 1989, by now I was responsible for all the East Europe work at the Independent, and I was witness to these amazing changes. And in June 1989, on the day that every single person in this room will remember, on June the 4th, 1989, when such horrific things were happening in Beijing, on that very same day, in Poland, they had partly free elections, where solidarity gained an unbelievable majority. They gained an almost embarrassing majority. In the newly elected seats in the Senate, they gained 99 out of 100 seats, which is kind of like, it sounds a bit anti-democratic, but the fact was this was the first time people had the real choice. They voted 99 out of 100 of the freely elected seats went to solidarity. Within a couple of months, they kind of broke the next set of rules by having a, a solidarity prime minister, in other words, a non-communist prime minister. Again, pretty much as unthinkable as a non-communist prime minister in China today. It was so, the Communist Party leader was still absolutely in power in Moscow, Mikhail Gorbachev, and was still the leading role of the party and so on. So they became it. And then, this is the end of this little set of stories. That happened in June 89, June, uh, August 89 as a prime minister. And what happened in November 89? The Berlin Wall came down. The Berlin Wall didn't come from nowhere. It came from a whole range, and of course it involved the courage of many, many hundreds of thousands of East Germans who also risked their lives for that change. But those little fragments <coughs> of mischief and change and opposition, all of that built towards the incredible changes that happened in, in the Berlin Wall. <coughs> um, so many, many other stories like that uh, from many more countries than I could count over the years, and again, happy to, to go to more, we get to, to question and answer a bit. My second couple of stories come from Burma, or Myanmar. Um, and as all of you will well know, until 
a very few years ago. That was a, a horrific, it's still a country with many, many problems and, and actually much more troubling from a human rights perspective than we would hope. But changes have also taken place, important changes. After the massacre of 1988, known as the 4 massacre, um, on the eighth of the eighth month, on the eighth day of the eighth month of 1988, um, when thousands were killed um, seeking democracy, and Aung San Suu Kyi that had been, uh, she had come back as part of this democracy movement, and it was all this killing that took place. Uh, elections took place in 1990, which her party won, uh, gained by way the majority of seats, and the reward for that was that Aung San Suu Kyi was put under house arrest, and she spent pretty much the next 20 years either under house arrest or indeed in jail. I myself was really lucky to meet her in, in 1988, during one of the small, as it turned out later, one of the small windows when she was not under house arrest. Um, I was a journalist, we of course got kicked out when they realized that we met with her, but that was fine, um, because we'd already got the interview with her and we'd got all the, the material we needed, and she had said very powerful things about the situation in her um, country. And it seemed that nothing would ever change. And in, uh, but the, there were little fragments of opposition going on throughout that time, which to the outside world again seemed almost meaningless. And I and my co-author in this book as well would argue nothing of this was meaningless. The small bits were all part of a much bigger mosaic, part of a much bigger tapestry. So let me tell you two tiny bits of the mosaic. One was the story of the uh, one cat note in Myanmar. And uh, the authorities decided they needed a new one cat note, which is the smallest denomination of bank in the world. And the, most of the bank notes, or many of the bank notes, had on, their, uh, on the bank note would be a picture of Aung San, who was Aung San Suu Kyi's father, and also the the founder of an independent bank, so an incredibly important person, the founder of the country, really, uh, and of freedom from from Britain, from high in the country. Uh, so a real a real national hero. And even though his daughter was banned, he, as national hero, was still accepted. There was even an Aung San Museum at, at that time in Rangoon. So the designer was commissioned to create a banknote which would have in the watermark a picture of Aung San. So he said, fine did all the design, he made a very beautiful and a very intricate design, and there in the watermark was what appeared at first glance to be a picture of General Aung San, the founder of the modern Berlin state. And so off that went, and hundreds of thousands or millions of that banknote were printed, and it started being distributed. And then people noticed them. When they held it up to the light, and they looked closely at the watermark, actually, Aung San, this big, masculine general, <coughs> Aung San, had a rather feminine face. In fact, it was a very, very feminine face. And if you look quite closely, it looked much more like the daughter of the general than it looked like the general himself. In other words, the designer had smuggled in a picture of Aung San Suu Kyi, the woman who was completely banned, into the banknote. The authorities were, of course, furious, but all the banknotes were already out there. So they cancelled the banknote, but many Burmese kept copies of that banknote, of which I myself also have a, have a copy of one of those. It's, it's, it was called the democracy note. And people would hold it or keep a little crumpled copy of their democracy note. And so again, the authorities who thought they had the power, they spent all this money on printing the money, and then they discovered that there was democracy was hidden inside it. But again, it didn't seem to change anything. In 2007, all of you, many, all of you will know the story of the, the Saffron Revolution, the revolution initially led by monks, but many others took place, took part, brutally suppressed by the authorities. And this is another story for me of the wrongness of writing off the courage of others and the vision of others of believing in change. So those Burmese people believed they could achieve change. But again, I can remember again and again during that period listening to people on the radio, reading in the newspapers, saying, oh, oh, it's kind of nice that these people are demonstrating, but what could this possibly achieve? Because the Myanmar military are far too 
brutal, it's impossible to confront them, and nothing will ever change. And in the short term, they seem to be right. In the short term, there were many killings from that series of protests in, in late 2007. Many, many, many beatings and arrests from that time, and it seemed that nothing had changed. But what came as the postscript? Not that long after. You guys all know the postscript very well, which is in 2010, Aung San Suu Kyi was released uh, from house arrest, and now, of course, she's part of the parliament, and more changes are happening. Again, not enough changes, but that's a, you know, for, a, for another day. And I just wanted to finish off again this little segment with a second story from, uh, from Myanmar, which was at the time of her release. This was not yet a democracy by any means. And so the authorities, the censors, said, you must not put on the front page the fact that this woman has been released. You must pretend it doesn't really matter. And you can put it on the inside page or the back page, but it mustn't go on the front page. Of course, the Burmese were very excited that she was there. And one of the editors of the Burmese paper, a Burmese sports paper called 111, had this great idea. And uh, I apologize to the translators. I'm oh, actually not translation, which is easier. There's no translation. OK, so you all have to take it in English. Um, the, um, and I don't know how close the English football is followed in, in, in China. Um, but there was, in Burma, it is followed pretty much. And there was a, what seemed to be a football headline which was published um, in, the, uh, in the Burmese sports paper. And it said, Sunderland frees Chelsea, so Sunderland defeat Chelsea. United, Manchester United, stunned by Villa, so Manchester United lose to Aston Villa. And Arsenal advanced to grab their home. So it's a set of three football games on the weekend, front page of a sports paper, perfectly normal. Every single copy of the paper, of any paper, goes through the censor. And so this arrived. Crucial for this story is arrived on a black and white fax machine, and you'll see why that's important in a moment. So the black and white fax goes through to the censor with this football headline about English football from the weekend with all of these games results. Censor looks at it, sees the football games. I don't know which games, which teams he preferred or didn't prefer, but anyway, he said, yep, yeah, that's fine, no problem, off it goes, goes off to the printers. What the poor censor didn't know and none of the people in the regime knew until they woke up next morning and saw it on sale in the kiosks, was that the full color version of the headline looked completely different. So in those lines I described to you, Sunderland frees Chelsea, United, stunned by Villa, and so on. Sunderland, they take the words Su, so Aung San Su Chi, frees Chelsea, so Su, free, and then unite from United, unite and advance to grab the hope. That was the message that came out loud and clear in bright scarlet. The rest was a kind of dark brown. Dark scarlet was, bright scarlet was, Sue free, unite and advance to grab the hope. Um, and the editor, the paper was closed down for a while. The editor was arrested, but he didn't mind. He knew that was going to happen. Everyone in Burma loved the fact that the authorities had been made to look fantastically stupid by a word <coughs> These are the kind of stories I want to tell you of the little bits of change, and, and of course many, many, many negative changes sadly have happened in, in, in Myanmar in the meantime, but positive changes also. That space has been opened up through people believing that we can create space, and also if we can make people laugh a little bit on the way, then that is fantastic. Always there is this pessimism around. My own organization, Amnesty International, was created in 1961 more than 50 years ago. And when it's created, one of the critics at the time heard about this idea that you send lots of letters to people, and if you have enough letters put together, then maybe you can get people released from jail. And you know, it doesn't matter if they're left or right or anything, but if they have not used violence, then um, Peter Benenson, who created the organization, he called it uh, prisoners of conscience. He created that phrase, because they're not prisoners for any other reason except for their conscience. And the idea that you could change anything like that, it was described as one of the larger lunacies of our time, one of the craziest ideas imaginable. And yet, all of you in this room, I think, know how much that organization, which now has 7 million members and activists worldwide, those of you based here in the States, I very much hope that you uh, are or will become members. And those of you who have come from elsewhere, I really hope there will be a time where it's possible to have uh, a legal uh, Amnesty International 
office in, in, in pretty much every country in the world. Not, of course, possible at the moment. And so this is supposed to be one of the crazy ideas, but in fact, that pessimism was proved so, so wrong. So that's, I think, for me, been the lesson of my life, that I saw it, solidarity, as I described at the beginning, I saw things happen and become real, which every single, quote, clever person would tell you very confidently and very persuasively and very intelligently was completely impossible to achieve. And actually, the Poles achieved it. I mean, now they're, again, a country with problems today, but nonetheless, uh, a robust democracy, which is able to do many different things. Václav Havel, who was mentioned earlier, we felt very honored while, while he was still alive, wrote the preface to this book. And the reason we asked him to write the preface was because of a fantastic essay, which if you haven't read it, I'm sure many of you have, but if you have not read it, Absolutely, please read a fantastic essay called The Power of the Powerless. And it is a, an essay, a political essay of enormous beauty and power, <coughs> which basically talks about how regimes are there, but if everybody at the same time says no, if a few people say no, then there are many consequences against them. But the more people are saying no, at a certain point, the changes will come. Um, and he said, even when the changes haven't come, you have what he called living in truth, and the glory of living in truth, which was a power of its own. But then he described the power of the powers. In the preface of the book, he himself says, he said, I was described, including by people who liked him and knew him, he said, Václav, you are a Don Quixote, you are a Czech Don Quixote, tilting at the windmills. In other words, you cannot defeat anything. You're, you're going attacking this thing, but nothing will ever change. But 11 years after he wrote that essay, he wrote the essay in 1978, 11 years later, in November 1989, again, I was incredibly lucky. I was there first meeting him in, in late October, but then in November I was back, and in Wenceslas Square in Prague, in the center of Prague, hundreds of thousands of people came together. And it was kind of rather remarkable. The regime kind of collapsed within a week, basically. It began on Friday night with a student demonstration, and a week later, uh, the whole lot resigned. And I was there that night when, when that happened. And it was incredible. Now, fairy tale endings might happen in the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, as it was then, or the Czech Republic, are uh, few and far between. And we've all seen that where change has come elsewhere, it has often been much more problematic. But the idea of gaining some rights as you move forward, I think that's something which we can see again and again and again. And in terms of small things, the Helsinki process, a couple of our speakers referred to it, very, very important. It seemed so dull and process-ridden. It was an international agreement that was like boring, full of paragraphs, and kind of meaningless few paragraphs about freedom of expression and various basic human rights issues, which neither the West nor neither Washington nor Moscow believed it, really, they knew it nothing. It was just there for decoration. But the brave people in Czechoslovakia, in Poland, in Russia, and elsewhere, took this stuff, and, uh, and they made it real. In Czechoslovakia, Charter 77 came up as a, very much together with the Helsinki agreements, and of course, as you, uh, uh, as you know, Charter 88, uh, sorry, Charter 08, Charter 08 uh, in, in China, model itself with its name and its ideas on, on, on what happened there. Um, so that sense of achievability through nonviolence, I think, is, is remarkable. There's a great poem, which I, I love very much, by a Polish poet, Stanislav Baranczak, written in 1978, before solidarity even existed. And he said, it's called Those Men So Powerful. He said, you were so small compared to them who always stood above you on steps, rostrums, platforms, and yet it's enough for just one instant to stop being afraid, or let's say to begin to be a little less afraid, to become convinced that they are the ones, that they are the ones who are afraid the most. And again, we've heard some people making similar points in the last couple of days. So those are some of the thoughts I wanted to bring with, with me and to, to open it up for discussion. I, I'll just go through quickly my kind of list of the elements 
because the, uh, the title of this thing was about the nonviolent strategies and principles. And in a sense, I hope what I've described already gives you that idea of that the little, the little movements, I think that's the most important thing of it, you don't go for everything at the same time, you, you think of the little things that you can achieve. But let me go through some of the things which I think are, 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 are interesting and important. One, I've already mentioned, the power of humor, and, and I say what Sergio Popovich calls laughterism, and I think it's a very good phrase. Um, and uh, a second one is thinking of unusual things, you know, like the TVs in the wheelbarrows. They don't be funny as such at the time, but it's kind of unusual that people get interested. They were taking big risks, make no mistake. It's a nice story in this room, but the people who did it, some of them were indeed beaten and arrested and other things. It was real risks, but they were, they quite enjoyed in some ways the unusualness of what they were doing. And clearly the protests in Hong Kong had many, many elements of that, that humor and unusualness that I'm describing. Third point is knowing what you want to achieve and really hanging on for it. Many ones are lost out where there are so many different goals, no one knows exactly what they want and how and when. If you keep it focused, you go, that's what we're looking for now, and we're not going home until we get that. That's often where a lot of change can be achieved. And from an international perspective, so Amnesty International is, of course, there as a, a documenting organization, and also standing in solidarity with those who are already arrested. The additional bit that a human rights organization, a global human rights organization can bring is to bring uh, the global pressures of making other governments uh, put pressure to ensure that rights are observed in, in a given country. So, seeking the goal, there's a, a third element which is important. Also very important, not asking people to do too much. One of the lovely things, completely forgotten actually, one of the things I learned about the Prague protests, they didn't happen all day every day. I think in people's memories it's that they happened all day every day. That's not quite right. They started at about 4 o'clock every afternoon, and they finished at about 7 o'clock. So you could basically, uh, you could more or less go to work, in fact people did, you could go to work in the morning as normal, you might work from 8 till 4, you would then go to the square and demonstrate, and then you could go home and you could make dinner for the kids. And it was amazing. The effect was still there, that you would stand with a quarter of a million people in the square in Prague, and you didn't need to be there all day long. You were there for three hours every day, and from the authorities' point of view, the numbers grew every single day. So at the end of that week, it was like, if we stay here in the room, the whole country will be here. Enough, we're resigning, and, and the changes came in. Clearly, the dangers, as China knows better than any country, the dangers are very real throughout this of what might happen. The East Germans had that also where they were threatened with being killed, this was a few months after Tiananmen Square, they were threatened with being killed if they came out. And amazingly, more people came out that day than ever before. And again, there was a big retreat. Again, I can talk about it if people want to in the moment, in Leipzig on 9th of October, for those who are interested. So not asking people to do too much, a very, very important element. And then getting other people involved and broadening your sense of who you shouldn't feel this is not my kind of person. If somebody wants good change and wants rights, then stick together with them. They may not be your favorite person, doesn't matter if they're left or right or center or what their thinking is on a range of issues, but if they want rights for all people, then stick with them. You can have arguments about politics and all sorts of other things afterwards, but not now, not while you're thinking about how to create a situation where rights might genuinely be observed. And also to remember that people like policemen, policemen weren't born evil. And you know what? Maybe they're not evil right at this moment. They go home, they have families, they have kids, they have parents who worry about them. They're doing a job. So one of the very successful things that happened in Serbia, happened in many different places, is think of the policemen. They don't particularly, or indeed the soldiers, conscript soldiers, they don't particularly want to be doing this job necessarily. In the Ukraine, they held up old ladies, especially not only old ladies, but partly old ladies, the babushki, the grandmothers, would hold up mirrors into the face of the riot police, which said, look at yourself, my son. You are like my son or my grandson, and you are going to shoot people now? And it's fascinating to watch 
Yes, there was a lot of shooting in Kiev, as we know, but it was very unsettling for these young policemen to think, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person who's killing um, other people, or indeed doing the beating. And uh, in Serbia, they used to chant, they used to have songs in favor of the police, and uh, the police couldn't help smiling sometimes at that. So those are some of the basic principles. We've had a couple of times in the last couple of days, non-violence, does it really work? But a book has been mentioned, which I strongly encourage you to look at, if you don't know, to read, by Eric Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, Why Civil Resistance Works. It's a fantastic book with full of statistics. And they're not boring statistics, they're very exciting statistics. Because they are statistics which show this is not the exception actually to achieve more through non-violence than through violence. And violence may seem to be the shortcut. You know, I come along with lots of guns and all oh, the bad guys are dead. But finding an example where that's led to something good, you would search long and hard before finding an example where that's had a good outcome. And any of us can think of the many places around the world where it's ended up with bad outcomes. But those, and again, statistics, many statistics in the book, the ones where people have held on to non-violent change, that's where they've had the strongest chances of being able to uh, get positive change in the end. Uh, so I will uh, leave it there and very much look forward to your questions. Um, but in summary, impossible to believe, I think, too much in the possibilities of change from the courage of individuals or large numbers of people both inside a given country but also that solidarity which can be shown and the pressures that can be created from outside from other governments if governments who are comfortable in themselves they should be putting the pressure that's needed and with those two things combined amazing things can be achieved thank you very much Yes, thanks for Mr. Kroshow uh, is telling an interesting and inspiring story. Um, I think I learned a lot, I'm sure, so do you all. So before it, uh, his speech that uh, we casually chatting, he suggested to me ask you that when you ask your question, ask him hard question. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. In addition, I would like to recommend that uh, introduce yourself first before asking your question and then make your question uh, uh, short, so uh, more people can ask Mr. Grosso a question. Who is that? Hi, Steve. Uh, I'm Satin. I'm the one of the Tibetan delegates from Dharamsala, and uh, your talk was really, really interesting. Uh, thank you so much for it. Um, now, my question is: As someone uh, like you know, you have you have studied about so many movements that have happened in the world, and uh, I want to ask the question of the Tibetan movement. I'm sure you also have studied about it. What sort of difference do you think is there between the other movements in the Tibetan movement? And I'm, I'm asking this is because. Uh, Tibetan movement is, I feel, is something that's happening also in Tibet, but more also in exile too. Mm. And uh, how different is it that when you are having a non-violence movement in exile, and when you are challenging an authority which is way too distant from from an actual ground level, where where the people in exile are not really facing the consequences of the policies that are being implemented? So how 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 different do you? think it's from the other movement? It's a very good question, thank you. Um, I mean, to take the basics, of course, every single movement is different. I mean, although, you know, we find patterns of certain kinds, of course, every country is different. But you're right, the Tibet situation is very particular. I forgot to mention, I did mention that there's a Chinese edition which is about to come out. I didn't mention there's already a Tibetan edition which is available as a free download. So if you, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't know how to search for it, but I'm sure you would be able to. Um, and I was delighted when a publisher wanted to publish it, feeling there could be something which could be of interest for Tibetans in, in seeing different kind of stories of change. So you're right that in some ways those who are doing things are, some are, are outside the country. There are, of course, incredible acts of courage with terrible consequences inside Tibet as well. And 
very depressing for me, and I guess for all of us as well, is that self-immolation is sort of like a, an act of despair. So it's a, a protest, but a despair at the same time. And I find that terribly troubling because, not least, because it implies, obviously, a loss of hope completely. It, it's not making the change in itself. It's like, I no longer wish to be part of it. Um, so I guess that perhaps what those who are living in greater safety outside the country, if they are able to convey to those within the country that there can still be possibilities of change. I do believe, I mean, what we hear, of course, from um, His Holiness Dalai Lama is also belief in, in, in possibilities. That's, that's clearly the case. Um, and I think that within Tibet, I, I've, I've been struck by a number of the countries that I have been to over the years, which were still living in the middle of a very repressive situation. And people have said, no, no, but you don't understand. In my country, <coughs> things cannot change. It just won't change. And then sometimes what I'm particularly thinking of is Albania, actually. A long time ago, Albania it was more repressive. It was closer to North Korea today than it is to China. And I was in Albania before the big changes happened. And uh, people said to me, no, you don't understand. Nothing will ever change in Albania. And then I go to someone else a bit further on the street in another cafe and they say, oh, it's a very bad situation, nothing will ever change. And the next person, nothing will ever change. And at a certain point, I was thinking, too many people are telling me that they would like it to change. At a certain point, I do believe the change will come. And in fact, massive changes came in Albania. Many other places like that. So I think that what, from outside, clearly it's different having so many people outside and playing such a significant role. But I think to encourage people to remember in the possibilities of change is perhaps the most important thing. I speak as someone who does not, you know, you of course know the Tibetan situation much better than I do, but that's my, my takeaway from it. Um, and I say I was very moved by the fact that uh, Tibetan friends felt that it was worth translating for other Tibetans to be able to read uh, without cost. So I say it's on, on, on the, uh, the internet. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned this little changes like uh, you know pro police uh, protest uh, or you know push the students with the television. Um, but we see when you know democratization happens, there are a lot of other factors like economic crisis or internal you know elites political struggles between themselves, purge all this kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. I mean, how do you um, like separate those factors to you know make the argument that those little things that render a change, rather than you know those big things happen in you know, economic crisis or internal elite struggles? Yeah. Like how do you separate these two? Yeah. No, again, it's extremely. It's a very good question. It's an important question. Um, and in both the narrative of the book and in, in what I've said today, I have consciously involved all of the geopolitical changes, which are, of course, significant in different ways, and that includes, you know, a weakening economy and strengthening economy and economic expectations and, and all of these different things which can uh, which can create change. I think the reason that I and my my co-author John Jackson, who we met through Burma issues, and but, but Poland and Burma was in a sense the starting point of the book in, in many ways, was that we felt that those elements of the individuals and what ordinary people were doing had somehow got a little bit massaged out of the narrative. So the narrative became on Eastern Europe, for example, which is what I know best. I say I studied Russian, I lived in the old Soviet Union, I speak Polish, I lived in Poland, I traveled throughout the region, so I knew that area well. And the standard narrative has either that Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet leader, was the person who came along, and for these economic reasons he was there, and then he waved a magic wand, and the Berlin Wall was gone, and everyone lived happily. Or there is a more conservative narrative, which said President Ronald Reagan was there, and he was a good, robust, strong leader, and he faced down the communists, and the communists were so frightened of him that they all had to retreat and 
the West won and, and communism lost. And both of those narratives leave out, and probably the reason, one of the reasons I feel so passionate and convinced about it is that, and why I tell that Poland story in such detail, is because there, although economic factors are important, actually that mixture of courage and mischief and imagination, and with a small s, solidarity, in other words, people standing together and believing, that was the single most important factor. That the economics, even when they've been good or bad, they have pushed for certain changes. And so, I'm not saying it's the only factor, but combined with other factors, it makes a great difference. And the other nice thing for a reason to focus on this is because we can make, you know, together, we can all make a difference to that bit. Whereas whether the economy has gone to pieces or not, we find more difficult to influence. If we're in a democratic country, we can influence by who we elect. But broadly, we can't really change the economy. We can, if we're lucky, make influence in the politics. Does that make sense? Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if um, you make a distinction between uh, pacifism as an ideology and nonviolence as a tactic, and whether you can elaborate on the difference between those two. Um, as I said a moment ago, I, I kind of avoid the sociological analysis to some extent, the kind of uh, the, the language analysis uh, very much. But let me just answer it in, in common sense terms. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't describe myself as a pacifist as such. And for a European, the most obvious one to think about is the Second World War, where the failure was to, you know, not to stand up against an invading force uh, which invaded Czechoslovakia and people stood by, then invaded Poland. And, sort of stuff happened, but not enough, and, and, and so on. And, and Hitler was defeated by, he brought guns to it, and he was defeated by guns. Um, so I suppose in my mind there is a difference with, um, with the non-violence. I do believe it to be, there's a luxury of believing in non-violence, if you like, because I believe that it works as a strategy. <coughs> Let me start the way around. Ethically, it feels the better one, that you are not killing people in order to get to your goal. Um, but as I also described a moment ago with the Chinua Stefan book, and I forgot to say, very interesting, is that one of the authors of that book herself started as a complete skeptic. She went to a presentation about things, about how marvelous and advanced was. She said, well, you've just cherry-picked this. You've chosen the best examples. And like this doesn't really hold together if you look at the statistics. And someone said, okay, well, why don't you bring the statistics and show us if we're wrong? And she went to the statistics and then realized, and she did it for the first time, that actually the statistics showed the, quite the opposite of what she had expected. So one of the authors came from one position, the other came from the other, but they both realized that it does have a very real pragmatic impact, if you like. Um, in my lifetime, I've seen a significant change in understanding. So when I was growing up, when I was a student, um, there were many, many armed groups around the world who kind of many people saw as being you know, the hero liberators. So these people are picking up guns and getting rid of that government, and yay, we've got another lot. And indeed, very often those armed groups were getting rid of dictatorships. That's absolutely true in Central America or across Africa and elsewhere. And I would say a very common narrative was a kind of belief that somehow picking up those guns was fine. <clears throat> and and like, that was what you did. You, you, the bad guys used guns. You used guns against the bad guys. And then it was fine. It's only much more in retrospect that I've come to realize and look and think, actually, as the Chenoweth Stefan book points out with, in statistical terms, OK, they got rid of the bad guys, but how many times did those people who use guns to get there then descend into another kind of authoritarian set of rulers. Whereas those who are way more difficult use non-violence, the gains later were uh, truly amazing. There was an old-fashioned phrase, as, 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 as you know, as I think everyone is, is familiar with, of um, passive resistance. And 
you know, at a certain point, Gandhi's tactics were described as passive resistance. I'm glad to say that phrase is completely gone because, of course, it's the very, very opposite of passive. That is incredibly active and courageous and everything else. To walk into beating, to walk into gunfire, to walk into that, that's an incredibly bold and courageous statement. And there's nothing passive about it. You are becoming the actor. You are becoming the actor. That's huge. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. I mean, I, and since I have avoided you, I, I hope I haven't completely avoided your question. I, I say I'm not a pacifist in that broader sense of when there is a war between somebody who has invaded a country with a lot of tanks. I don't say, oh, let the tanks invade at that point necessarily. But I think that when you have a repressive government, including ones which kill, which is true of many of them, which arrest, beat, and kill, the idea of using guns and indeed violence to get a change, then I, I, I say it's a luxury now. If, if I only had one of those reasons for doing it, I might feel a little bit torn. But actually, it's both pragmatically and idealistically. I believe the better. Okay. Next question is over here. Um, you were talking about uh, pacifism, but I think also when we look at the Hitler example, where you were talking about really appeasement. And I think I, I look back to the history. Gandhi advocated nonviolent resistance to Adolf Hitler, but was ignored at the time. Mm. And I looked at in the in the question of the Third Reich in 1943, German housewives who organized a nonviolent strike got their husbands back from Auschwitz. Correct. So the question is, rather than 40 million dead in World War II, if they listened to Gandhi in the 1930s, you might have avoided a lot of unpleasantness. That, it's, it's an interesting point. And, and the story that you mentioned is a fantastic story, which I will, you're, you're right to highlight, and I will expand it a little for those who, who are not familiar. And we did mention it in the book. It's one of my favorite stories, actually. Um, I won't even ask for a show of hands now, because I'd be surprised if many people knew it. But um, the, the women of Rosenstrasse is, is the story to which you are referring. And Rosenstrasse, again, easily Googleable, an incredible story, and you just told it in miniature, that people, the wives of uh, who had, German women who had Jewish husbands, and at a certain point, so first, Jewish marriages, people were just shipped off to Auschwitz, to the concentration camps, where, as we know, they could expect to die. Um, and millions died in, 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 through the Holocaust. Um, and then came those mixed marriages where the Jewish husbands were taken away. And as you've just accurately described, they came to this place, the Rosenstrasse deportation point, where they knew the husbands were being held, and started protesting in the street outside in the Gestapo, the Nazi secret police, the, you know, the Nazi secret police imaginable, said, get out or we will shoot you. And it kind of makes my skin turn weird, even now telling the story. The women said, OK, shoot us. If you want to shoot us, shoot us, they said. And even the Nazis, even the Nazis, which stopped at absolutely nothing, kind of were a bit unsettled about shooting down these women in broad daylight in the middle of Berlin. The Rosenstrasse Street is, runs just on Alexanderplatz, which is the most central, uh, central square in Berlin, so it's right in the center of the city. And day after day, more and more of the women arrived. So first it started with 10, 20, and then the, the they didn't exactly have mobile phones to tell each other, but others knew what was happening. Several hundred gathered. And Goebbels, Hitler's chief propagandist, wrote in his diary, this was, he said, a very unpleasant scene. <laughs> and they finally backed off. Again, as, as you rightly described, I'm telling the story at length because it's such an incredible story to remember. And so they said, OK, 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 go home, and your husbands will join you. And I'm sure that some of you were quite skeptical even then. And again, as you rightly described, some of them were still at the deportation point and came home directly. Some of those husbands had already arrived in Auschwitz, the place from which there was no exit. And one of those was called out and was told, you are now going home. And he thought to himself, I'm obviously not going home. That's not going to happen. What hell can possibly be worse than where I've already been? They put him into a train, he arrives in Berlin Central Station, and he goes home. The only thing was, like, 
will you say that you had good treatment? He said, yes, yes, I will say I had very good treatment. Uh, it wasn't that funny. Um, that story, unarmed women forcing Hitler to back down, is, as you rightly say, an absolutely incredible story. And it's such an incredible story that in Germany, I make a direct connection to this. For me, that is why it was not very widely known in Germany after the war. Because the very strong implication is if 300 unarmed women could force that big a retreat, what on earth would have happened if millions of Germans, many of whom were indeed frightened of the regime, there's no question. I mean, it wasn't all the Germans were desperate to do bad things, there were many poisonings that happened in Germany. But what would have happened if more had said no? And that women's story is, is, is absolutely right. So yeah, again, it's uh, a, the, the Gandhi quotes are interesting in that, that context, but I, above all, what I take away from that story is what I'm sure you take away as well is how extraordinary it is what can be achieved. That's true. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, uh, I, I'd like to introduce myself. My husband named Lin Jiaxi. I came here mainly because of him. Frankly saying, before I, I, I only know non-violence from uh, from my old uh, political books, maybe or whatever. So, but uh, after my husband was arrested, I think I really adore, 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 I will adore this kind of. Uh, solution to do non-violence. Um, I missed the, it's a pity, I missed the first part of your discussion. I don't know if you discussed specifically in China situation, I really think there's a lot of difficulty. Because the first thing, like this morning one reporter said, the brainwash. Because I just feel doing non-violence, maybe need some um, common understanding or say, need some basis to start with the non-violence. But sometimes, if people's brain are really washed, you, you feel difficult to get in, just, to, I don't know. So my question is, for China, the situation as for how to start this kind of uh, non-violence uh, strategy, and uh, I, I don't know, because I just start to study about this side, but I, I need to still investigate. When you do non-violence, how many percent of the people need to have the concept, common concept, we are using the non-violence? Or for example, if we want to do an activity, does that mean all the people in the team they all need to know basic non-violence uh, concept, or maybe 30%. Because in China, the situation is uh, we have so many people. Some people, the level are very different. Some people maybe know a little bit. Some people completely do not know. In this kind of situation, do you think non-violence can be a way also? For me, I sometimes very pessimistic. I think it's no space for it yet. Right. And I will say, through internet right now, uh, some of my friend is doing a fantastic job. They are trying to introduce some book to China uh, through their activity, introduce the strategy to, but she can only do it in Taiwan. I believe in China, mainland China, not too many people know the non-violence concept. My husband, they had, I, I remember they had one meeting that completely crashed down. All the people are taken away. So it's very difficult in China. I don't know if there is any research. Just In a way there is. Let, let me ask you a question. Yeah, I, I'm glad you asked the set of questions because I think that Skepticism about an advance is often there. So let me tell you a, a couple of things. To answer your question, no, I deliberately didn't describe China very much because there's been so much China discussion. 
Um, but at the back of my mind and the back of your minds, of course, is China. And actually, there are some very, very vivid examples of, of um, things that people have done in China. But let me step back. Uh, another thing which we haven't discussed this evening, but as my understanding of it, uh, and I guess for many of us, understanding of it is, is very important, is the way the civil rights movement in the United States worked. And so, to take your question about people understanding the violence, I don't think you need to understand something, because people know what violence is. And believe me, and I'm sure you would agree with me on this, if on the television news or even on the front page of a newspaper, you see the protester you know, attacking somebody, destroying the shop windows, doing, using the violence, many people, I would argue probably most people, especially those who don't think very much about politics, but even those who do, go, uh-uh, I'm not that interested in those people. I don't like it. I don't know much about it, but when my government tells them they're doing bad things, I'm kind of inclined to believe my government, because I can see that they're breaking things, they're destroying things, they're attacking people, or they've blown something up, and I don't like my country being blown up. So if I know nothing about what's happening, and even if I do know a little bit, if I'm standing on the sidelines, and, this, and the other way around, if I see people beating up somebody who is standing there doing nothing, maybe is offering a flower to a soldier or a police person and is then being hit, if I don't think about politics at all, I think, I don't like that. That young woman was standing there with a flower, and then she's beaten to the ground? What can that mean? And so you don't need to, quote, understand nonviolence. You certainly don't want to read books on nonviolence. You could get very bored. Uh, I don't get bored. You probably don't get bored. But for most people, they're not interested in the theory. And that's quite right. They're not interested in the theory. They're interested in the reality. So what did the civil rights protesters uh, do? I'm sure many of you do know this story. I find it fascinating, the stories. They practiced again and again and again when trying to get black rights in the south of the United States where broadly, as I'm sure you all know, it was like an apartheid system. We had the United States, which is the beacon of democracy, but fundamentally it was the same as apartheid South Africa in most obvious respects. Incredible, the, the lack of rights that existed there right through to the 1950s, to some extent the 60s. Problems, of course, continuing to this day, but, but really entrenched both in law and in practice. And uh, as, as many of you will know, one of the big protests was about segregated seating, for example, in, uh, in cafes and in bars and, and in, uh, in department stores was a place that it went to. And so in order to practice the principles, they would sit together in a room and be abused close up by someone who would say vile, racist things into your face and then push people to the floor and say horrible things. And the practice was like, I will zen myself. I will go past this, because I will be better than you. And in due course, many of the victories came quite quickly. Some took much longer. And some, you could say, was over the arc of 50 years, leading to the election of a black president, whose, the marriage of whose parents, one black, one white, would have been illegal in more than half of the American states at the time of his birth. <laughs> For me, I have to go back to that statistic again and again because I can't believe it's right, but it is correct. Um, so, incredible changes in the country, but it started with those small things, and those photographs of people not being violent, being beaten up by violent people, and the police either being part of the beating up or standing by, it was an extra vote. That shocked and woke up people elsewhere in the United States, but also in the rest of the world, who went, what? I can't believe that this is happening. Whereas, if those same people had said, well, they use violence against us, so we will use violence against them, they would lose. So I think the heart of it is incredibly practical. And I would very strongly argue um, that but it does go right to the category. What I ask for is asking the difficult questions, because that is the difficult kind of question. It seems to be simpler to go for the quick solution of the violence, but actually it makes the world cascade and loses you the support of the many, many others who, who you need to have. Um, 
And I think I'll leave that. I mean, you, you asked a number of important questions. What percent need the common concept? I, I think that everywhere, everywhere, and or I'm not an expert on China, I think in China this is particularly true, are fearful of the chaos that comes with violence. Now, I think it's a very strong feeling in China, but it's a strong feeling everywhere. <laughs> and so that peacefulness, if you force the authorities to be the ones using the, the violence, that's, again, going back to Sergei Popovich's quote, that's when they have lost, basically. And so I think the courage, it's, it's not for me to say, I'm, I'm, I sit comfortably in an armchair and I'm not affected. So I'm describing what I have observed, which is the incredible courage of people take enormous risks, you know, be it the, the Liu Xiaobo, the Gao Yu, I mean, there's so many, of course, who, and, and many, many lesser known people who've taken risks, but each of whom I think can help to create change, can help to get a more rights-respecting China, and what we, those of us who are outside the country, need to do is to continue to speak, and governments can speak. So, I hope at least, if only 10% of what I said has convinced you, I think it's very important not to believe that, uh, that violence is somehow the right solution. I think it's not a solution. Yeah, you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, it was a great question. I would, I would like to follow up on that. Um, uh, well, first of all, I, I just my, my opinion is that the violence, uh, non-violence we don't know if it's going to work or not, we're hopeless, but definite violence will not work. I mean, if we that that's the thing. Yeah. The second thing, following up the second question. will not work in China. Right, right. Because everyone sees democracy as a chaos. Violence will cause huge chaos in China. I think we'll move on to another thing. I, I, I think people would certainly argue that violence would be seen as chaos. I don't disagree with you that some may see democracy as chaos, but providing violence as part of a path towards democracy that would give them every right to believe that democracy means yeah. chaos because it is violence. Whereas seeing people who have the incredible discipline, and I won't list here, but the incredible dignity, the unbelievable dignity of people who stand and who in effect are doing what those protesters from America are doing. It's not physically the same. In Hong Kong actually it was. Hong Kong consciously mirrored what had happened in the 50s in the States. I'm like, I'm not going to hate you back. Um, and the people who broke that rule damaged the movement more generally. It was only a small number, but they damaged the movement more generally. Yeah, <coughs> yes, and also um, minority rules and minority rights. Also, also yes, also. minority rights, obviously, right. I haven't discussed it, many others have, but of course, it is implicit in everything I'm saying is that the universal rights and that respecting all around, that's of course a given right. right. So here's my question following up on the uh, yeah. word question. Um, is that um, let's say if the country has no moral or ethic standards um, in terms of the story you have told that they um, couldn't shoot a woman. What if they have no such moral standard? Yeah, what if I just shoot them? You know, if I can get away with it, sure. I'll get away with it. In mean, this kind of situation, sure. how, what can we do? Um, you, the, again, the question is absolutely right and it was perfectly possible that they would have been shot. And it would probably be the least appropriate if I was, it couldn't really happen, but if, you know, if I was sitting on a platform in 1943 to be able to say, what should these women do? But, but taking a contemporary example there, it would be the least appropriate thing in the world for me to say to people, oh, you should go and do that because this would have this effect. Because nobody can know what the effect will be. Absolutely nobody. And so each person is making a choice about what happens. But I referred earlier to Václav Havel and his essay, which I say, for those who haven't read it, I strongly encourage the essay about living in truth. And it's about the power that goes with the living in truth. And it is not for anybody from the outside, and clearly I am from the outside, I am not threatened. I mean, I have been arrested in my life, but each time I've been arrested, I've known that I'll be out quite soon, thank you very much. I have never faced the risks uh, that others face today. Um, so, all I would do, and that's what the book tries to do, is without, it, it provides the minimum of analysis, but it merely shows that in many, 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 very different circumstances in many different parts of the world that have been positive outcomes. 
And so at some point it becomes perverse to say, although many countries do it, my country is different, a good outcome is not possible. And that's been said at different places at different times, and I think those, those, it basically sits with all of us to get the positive change. I think uh, we have uh, five minutes left, I think, to last the question, I believe. Okay, so probably last two questions, then uh, we will... Uh, Steve, I would love to hear your thoughts on the uh, Indian film, Indian film movement. Uh, uh, I think the whole world felt like the Indian film movement was a non-violent movement, which it is, I consider. But then there were also pockets of violent movement. Uh, example, uh, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, who started the whole Indian army, yeah. and then you have uh, people like Bhagat Singh and Chandrasekhar Azad. So, do you somehow feel that um, it's because of you know uh, these small pockets of violence? movement or uh, violence incident that compelled the British to, to move towards Gandhi or because they couldn't just, you know, uh, you know they can't just go, go on a war because it's the whole World War II is happening and they can't just afford another war. So, uh, yeah, not to hear your thoughts on that. So, I, I'm, I'm absolutely not an expert, let me say, on, on, on that. Um, and you're right, in a way it goes to an earlier question, which is also quite right about other factors like economics. So, while I talked about the collapse of the Soviet Union in terms of all those pressures, one of the things that made it more difficult to invade Poland, or to keep it up actually to be exact, was they just invaded Afghanistan and then they had Poland as well. So if you kind of got all these different stuff that you're doing in different places, it makes it difficult. Um, and so obviously there were many different factors which ended with, the, um, with, with Indian independence and, and Gandhi's most famous action was in 1930 and uh, you know independence didn't come until you know, 15 years after that um, so many different elements all the, what i take away and i guess everyone taking away looking at those events it's fascinating many of you i'm sure you are familiar with how mocking the british were when he first said that this is what he was planning to do and the viceroy, the British ruler of India, writes this mocking reply, basically saying, why would I be interested in your silly little walk to the sea? <laughs> you know, it means nothing to me. And then the British are humiliated by, by what has happened. And again and again and again, we've seen rulers who believe that they hold all the cards, and at a certain point, realize that they need to respect some rights. And if they don't, then they will lose more than if they do. At a certain point, that's the, that's the magic moment when it can come. It's when a particular regime, ruler, occupier, other, will understand that actually it is in everybody's interests to obey some rights and to give some rights and, and to move forward. And I do think that the, the Salt March and, and the the smallness of it was the essence of it. That's really what was so powerful about the Salt March. It was such a small thing. It was a small thing which affected everybody. So yeah, going back to your question, which is like the economics, of course there were other issues, and I don't feel an expert on those, but, but other issues for sure. Okay. Uh, so, last one. Young lady from Taiwan, last question. Uh, hello, yeah. I'm uh, from Taiwan, and I was, actually my question was, I can raise by your question is because uh, maybe you know about that like just in last year last year in March like, we have like one of the biggest occupied movements in Taiwan like in years and um, the thing is uh, you know then after that like the this uh, the concept of uh, nonviolence resistance have just raised you know in our like public discussion because um, even though like like during like during uh, your discussion, it seems like we got this really clear understanding about you know, the difference of violence and non-violence. But I think maybe in Taiwan or in most Chinese-speaking societies, like there's a lot of people that would regard breaking the law as a violence mean. Which is like, like for example, like even though during like the um, sorry, the civil like the civil rights movement, all those things, like sometimes it's really necessary. Like when you are doing uh, some kind of resistance, you have to break the law, even though in the you know peaceful way. But there's so like a lot of people that have this really low. I, I would say really low tolerance of you know the mean of resistance and like what can we do about that? Yeah. Uh, 
thank you again, a, a, a good question. To not only is the question about breaking up, but actually going back to violence and non-violence, I have repeatedly heard um, in, in some parts of the world in particular, people who are using violence in their struggle will tell you very confidently that under <coughs> international law, if the occupier is using violence against you, it is okay to use violence against. <laughs> and, and it's interesting how you have to say, no, actually international law is very clear that you, could, you, you may be able to use against the armed occupier uh, according to the, the careful way that international, the Geneva Conventions are fixed. But actually blowing people up in cafes or, or blowing people up on a bus, that is never, not only is it not ethical, not moral, but actually there is no possible justification that an international law is absolutely banned. But it is interesting how people strongly believe it. It's a myth that goes around that if there's bad over there, then I, I, we can do anything on our side, which includes, I say, blowing up their civilians in a cafe or blowing up their civilians in a bus because they do bad things to us. So, um, but taking on one about obeying the law or what, I think, I mentioned earlier a couple of times about Slav Havel and the, also the Helsinki process. One of the very, very, very interesting things about what Havel and others in Eastern Europe at that time achieved was that they never actually broke the law. It was the government that broke the laws. That was the cleverness of the protest, was that they said, ah, so <laughs> under paragraph 16.3, subsection 2, you have guaranteed us these certain things. So therefore, you must give it to me. And even in that repressive regime to find a criminal code which attacked that person when he was mere, he or she was merely talking about what they had signed up for was quite difficult. Now they were of course able to, but only in the ridiculous way which was not really in agreement with the law in any way. A modern Chinese equivalent is of course um, one that I referred to briefly in my um, remarks of the, on the opening of, of, of the conference uh, yesterday. Um, and others have referred to Gao Yu, the, the, the journalist who uh, jailed for years for, quote, disclosing state secrets. Well, disclosing state secrets meant um, telling other people that the state authorities themselves don't wish to obey the various things that they have signed up for in terms of international covenants on civil and political rights, for example. So the absurdity there, it's again, it's them who's breaking the law. And I think that although there will be moments where people do find themselves breaking the law, actually the more that you can stay within the law, kind of, the stronger the position is, basically, I would say. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kroos, for giving uh, one good talk and fantastic question and answer session. And uh, thanks for everyone to stay and do now. And thank you for lots of great questions. They're always the most energizing part of the talk. Thank you.